The views and opinions of this program are those of the host guests and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you by Growmark FS. Keeping up with the latest in ag is a challenge, to say the least, but there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic grain and energy solutions bored of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up-to-date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. Well, it was not a pleasant day in the markets on Wednesday. We'll call it a washout Wednesday, a rough one in corn, beans, and the wheat trade, too, even though KC Wheat did its best to try and hang on to some strength, but it succumbed to all the pressure that was in the other markets as well. We're going to try to make sense of it. Joining us here today, Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. And, Mike, good to talk with you. Um, we were chatting off air we got to break the streak of the market being lower when you and I talk uh, here on the show because, man, oh, man, just a, a rough, sick-looking commodity market, in my opinion, uh, after Wednesday's action, Mike. It was, and, you know, I was trying to think of something nice to talk about, happy to talk about, and then I realized that Jesse is getting married here <laughs> to his lovely bride-to-be, Katie, and we're very happy for you. We're very excited for you, Jesse. We wish you the greatest of weddings this weekend and a great honeymoon, buddy. And when you come back, we will have that turnaround that you're talking about. Well, I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. And uh, and I'm hoping that is the case. I, I'm, I truly hope that we can find that turnaround after I, I take a, a week-long sabbatical of sorts from the show. <laughs> Man, uh, I, I tell you what, Mike, I, I just I don't know where to start. I, I know that Maybe the, the bright spot of anything, and it's not really a bright spot, is, is Kansas City wheat. We're finding the concerns with the wheat crop in Kansas with the Quality Council tour this week. And, and that's where most of our strength has been this week, uh, out, outside of Monday. I, I mean, it's just been a rough couple of days here throughout the rest of the grains. It has. And, and you know, there's two major things that are going on in my mind right now, Jesse, and that re one of them relates to what you just talked about, too to be an analyst and do your own research and be correct on the WASDE report on the wheat yield and wheat production in no small part because you knew what was happening in terms of Dust Bowl-like conditions in a large swath of Kansas. To see the USDA pick up on that and then to see that the wheat quality tour came in with their day one yield total of, uh, what was it, 29.8 bushels that I went back all the way to 2003. I can't find a day one lower than that. And last year was 39.5 bushels. And so we're talking about literally almost 10 bushels less than the worst year, which was last year. And that makes me believe even more, along with some winter wheat conditions up in the northeastern part of the country, like Idaho and Montana, getting hot, very hot for this time of year. Um, that we are due for more wheat yield reductions. Mm -hmm. And so to ha to be right on the USDA report, to be right on um, a May report and, and nail it like that and then see the market do this um, and see, yes, the hard red wheat stood up, but the soft red wheat now threatening to go through its lows from April of around 610 and its 200-month moving average of around 611, two big numbers, by the way, for me. Um, to see that with the Black Deal grain extension being signed, which I did not think would do, would be done. But even in light of that, you can have all the ships you want in Ukraine coming into the Black Sea, but you're not going to have the same crop size as you had last year, let alone what you had two or three years ago. They're going to be down 50 percent, it looks like, by, by all uh, scenarios that I can see, down 50 percent in their corn. And that means they're not going to be an exporter essentially of corn like they have been mm -hmm. in the past few years, you throw on top of that Argentina. Yeah. That, that, that leads me into point number two. Point number two is this irrational trade, as I would call it, that we're seeing on Wednesday. Um, if it weren't for the Chinese economic data that I've seen and the fact that what you've taught, you and I've talked about, about China probably going into recession and them experiencing deflation, 
I'd say this is one of the best buying opportunities in wheat and corn that I've seen since before the Ukraine war and maybe even going back five or six years. Yeah, great points you make there. And and we talk a lot about wheat and we've been on this on this topic of wheat being the leader up or down here in the markets for a few months now, Mike. So I, I want to stick with wheat a second here and thinking about that WASD report you mentioned, I'll pull up a chart here on our uh, video feed you shared with me. Uh, just looking at ending stocks here uh, and really this wheat market, I, I look at some of these numbers, I hear what you say and I, I'm with you. It feels like an irrational trade here right now. It is. And, and you have really only Australia out there that can really pump up the volume and they already have started to take some of our demand away, our corn demand away specifically. But, you know, what we've experienced and why wheat is the leader in my mind, in part, is because it becomes a feed grain. It takes over for corn. It's responsible for the Chinese corn cancellations. Once again, today, I think it is mainly responsible for the Chinese corn cancellations. <clears throat> and I say that because as we'll talk about here in a minute, we've got some real issues with the second crop Brazilian corn production potential. But sticking with the wheat, I, I really do feel like the trade is in a 22-23 mindset because this Black Sea deal getting extended, they have not jumped over to 23-24 yet. And I'd just be watching very carefully, very closely for what we've talked about a lot lately, Jesse, get the European Union futures market, the Paris wheat, Paris corn, underneath us, that's going to be led by the cash markets. And so cash, I think we're back to a point in both corn and wheat and beans for that matter, where cash has got to stop this bleeding and stop the funds from doing what they're doing. And I think we'll be able to do that. And I would not put out of the realm of possibility at this point that still we could have a higher close in May. Well, let's look at this next chart as well. This is the HRW historical chart. Walk us through this and walk us through some of the things you're seeing here right now, Mike. Well, a lot of people have talked about 2013 when it comes to corn, and, and we are very similar to 2013, but I would also say we're very close to uh, 2008 when it comes to the hard red wheat. And that's where the corn, I think, differentiates itself from 2013. It's got the same feel as 2013 in corn because China's back at it. It was the MIR-162 genetics that they canceled on us in 2013, if I remember right. Now we've got just pure out cancellations. But if you look at this chart, hard red wheat chart, 2023 looks a lot more like 2008 because we do have a tighter crop. And so what I'm looking for here is this year to see hard red wheat turn the soft red wheat higher and that's backed up by the fact that we don't have as much supplies to compete with us coming out of Europe or coming out of the Black Sea region because of lighter production in Ukraine and Russia <clears throat> selling out essentially of its crop. And so that's a major distinction for me why I think this year's corn could be more like 2008 because I think this year's wheat's more like that. Well, thinking about corn and soybeans as well on the new crop side, Dees corn, November beans, uh, December corn, four ninety nine at the close on Wednesday, and November beans, well under twelve, eleven eighty seven and a half. Uh, to me, those have been very important psychological levels. What's your thoughts here for farmers? They take a look at that, and they, I, I no doubt, probably reach it for the Alka Seltzer if they haven't done enough marketing uh, in this situation, Mike. But uh, those feel like very key levels to me. They are, and that's why the funds are probably going to try and press this market hard down if we don't see the cash market fight it. And I think this goes back to what the USDA gave us for average prices. Even with the 2.2 billion bushel carryover and a 330 million bushel carryover in beans, we're now below, well below the USDA average cash prices in corn especially. We have been in wheat for some time, and we talked about this. We talked about how soft red wheat went to a carrying charge market while the corn, the beans, and the hard red wheat remained inverted. Now we're starting to see that peel away because the soft red wheat hasn't bottomed. And so my suspicion is, is that the soft red wheat is the one that really has to bottom. I think the beans want to bottom here. I think we've priced in enough negativity for now, and the prices have gone down enough for now that even Brazilian bean producers probably won't sell much of their new crop bean hedges at this point or cash beans at this point. So <clears throat> I, I think there's a lot lining up here, especially if the Brazilian provinces of Mato Grosso and Paraná stay dry, 
we've got a big reason why the end users, instead of pulling back from the market and pulling bids and widening basis, um, and, and even after this report um, came out, they did this because of what's going on right now. They're going to have to reverse thrusters because they're going to get caught short, I think. We're having a conversation today with Mike Zuzolo of Global Commodity Analytics here on Market Talk. Mike, uh, you made a great point about Brazil. I want to pull up another uh, map on our video feed you shared with me for today's show and, and talking about the surface moisture for Monte Grosso and Paraná. Looking at Brazil, obviously that's the free to corn crop off to a good start. But as you look at what's going on in South America, uh, any worry creeping in for you here at this stage of the game? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I see it in the models that I'm looking at right now, about 10 days of above normal temperatures and very little precip. And notice on these two graphs that you see in underneath the provinces depicted in the maps that you're talking about just about 50% of Brazil's corn production. And the vast majority of that is the second crop corn. And so <clears throat> while the surface moisture is still above last year, in Mato Grosso, it's been falling dramatically ever since the middle part of April. And we have only, you know, worsened our moisture levels on the surface uh, for Paraná, Jesse. And so subsoil moisture levels are still okay. They're adequate. But 10 days of hot, dry weather will put this crop in a real difficult situation because it's so behind that this would be kind of the early pollination phase. And so it could become a real issue real fast. And We've still got most of the private trade and the USDA out there pumping up the volume of a, of a total corn crop in Brazil of 125 plus. I think that it's going to be hard to get even a 125 out of this if we stay hot and dry for another 10 days. And this is where the July corn comes into play. This is where the Chinese corn cancellations come into play. Why would China cancel corn unless they're getting wheat if they see the same thing that I'm seeing? And that's a great point that you've made here now a couple times on the show today is everything with China, with the cancellations and possibly getting wheat. Uh, to me, that makes total sense because I was searching for some sort of reasoning as to why we're seeing these corn cancellations from China. Your point is a pretty good point, I think, is as far as why this is happening and what China may be doing here, Mike. Yeah. And the only other thing I can can say that we need to watch out for on that, Jesse, is that the livestock liquidation mm -hmm. in the hogs. And that's where hogs may be a real bullish feature in this market in the second half of 2024, especially as we get close to the end of the calendar year, because we're facing liquidation here. We may have seen so much liquidation in China. They just don't need the corn and don't need as much wheat either. <clears throat> that could be the other scenario. So that that's the only those are the only two things that I could think of as to why they'd be canceling corn. Well, you mentioned hogs. Let's go over to livestock and talk about that trade here midweek. And I'll start with hogs so we can come back to cattle. And man, hogs, I was hoping for another higher day. You had a good day Monday, Tuesday, the front months were higher, and then Wednesday we just couldn't follow through with it. And this seems to be the tale of the hog market here. The last how many months we can't find consecutive days in a row to follow this thing through higher, it seems, Mike. I was nervous after Monday's trade because China's industrial output and also their retail sales for April, while they were higher, they both missed trade expectations by a lot in some cases. And I think that's where this pork and bean trade may start to redevelop because it's China related. A lot of people have asked me, why are the beans getting hit so hard? Well, the WASDE report kicked it off, but I think also because of China and I think the economy that China is facing and the deflationary pressures that they're facing, their currency is now at one of the weakest points it's been since late 2022. So their buying power is going down in terms of US dollars. And that really hurts us here in the United States, especially when they've had all these bilateral agreements signed with Brazil and they're starting to trade in each other's currencies. And so <clears throat> soybeans, I think, continue to be the biggest fear of mine in the long term. When you go back to those 499 closes in, in corn and sub $12 closes in beans, it, it seems to me that the beans could be still on their way down uh, after a couple maybe rallies, weather rallies. Um, or cash-led rallies. It's a, it's a difficult situation, um, and the hogs are right there in the middle of it. 
Let's talk cattle. Let's talk the feeder market. One more chart on our video feed here. Uh, walk us through the, the monthly feeder chart. I, I know feeders have kind of still been a strength of this cattle market for a little while now. What's your take on, on where we stand right now? Yeah, feeders look toppy to me. And, and if you look at the small orange square or uh, rectangle down at the bottom right, you're starting to get a sell signal on the stochastics on a monthly basis. And that's something that's a a, a caution flag, if you would, to use kind of an F1 or IndyCar term. Um, we've got a caution flag on potential new buyers coming to the feeders. This makes sense because the feeder fat spread is now upwards of $40 premium to the feeders. We got up to about $44 on a weekly closing basis last year, and that was one of the, that was a multi-year high. So we're really getting rich in feeders, and we need the cash market and fat cattle to develop and transition and be kind of the leader to the upside. If it's not, then I think we could have a 2014, 2015 scenario develop something similar to where you had, you know, a, a pretty nice uptrend and then you went vertical and, and you just went, you know, afterburners higher. Then you had to come back down and test that long term trend. I'm wondering if we're not setting something similar to that up in this current feeder market. So this chart from a variety of areas and also looking at the updated WASDI numbers from USDA getting done with my special uh, livestock cattle report a couple weeks ago puts me kind of uh, in pole position uh, in terms of getting some hedges in place, especially for those back-end feeders as that January cleared 225 and made new contract highs again this week. In the fat cattle trade, a little bit of green on the screen there Wednesday, so maybe that's our, our one positive that we could have possibly. Uh, uh, what's your thoughts there? I know as well, both fats and feeders, we got a cattle on feed report coming up Friday that I think is going to be on traders' minds as well here, Mike. Yeah, cattle on feed and debt ceiling, those are two reasons to stay out of the cattle market and maybe even be a light hedger here if we can get another bump up, but still got a discount in the June versus the cash, so not a real premium in the futures, but would not be a long in this market right now in case that debt ceiling went bye-bye and all of a sudden the equities markets got trashed and the fats picked up on that. Well, you mentioned debt ceiling. I should ask you about that before we run out of time. You were, you were looking forward to that. Oh, why'd I say that? Uh, I, I guess I'll parlay it like this, Mike. Uh, stock market, a pretty solid day Wednesday. Energy is a pretty solid day, but we obviously have the debt ceiling issues out there. Uh, what's your read midweek on this uh, on this broader market trade and just some of that upward movement that we saw on Wednesday? It didn't make sense compared to the ags. Right. Excellent question, because the, the, I think both the dollar and the equities have priced in a short term deal. I think we're going to get a short term deal. But uh, if we don't get a short term deal, I'd be looking at the dollar and the equities to be kind of the uh, leaders to the downside, because um, we've never been in this situation before. And I can't see how. If our credit rating goes down again by S&P, um, how our dollar can't uh, not lose a lot of value against a lot of other currencies. Great thoughts. All right, before we wrap it up, I'll leave the uh, floor to you. Any final thoughts, anything you want to reiterate for folks here today, Mike? No, I just say, you know, the calls I've been taking have been really intelligent, good calls and keep them coming. Don't get into that bury your head in the sand type mindset. Stay, keep your head up, keep your chin up in these markets. Get a trial subscription to globalcomresearch.com and take a look at what we uh, do and, and stay on top of this market. Globalcom with two M's, research.com. And that's where you can find all the information for Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. Mike, again, thank you as always. Appreciate the time. And uh, we'll talk to you uh, real soon when I get back in a couple weeks. And I know next week you'll chat with Mike Pearson, who's filling in for me. So appreciate it. Well, tell the future Mrs. Allen, congratulations. <laughs> we'll definitely do that. Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics, our guest analyst here on today's show. Let's go do it for Market Talk. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.